I remember as a young boy uh, with my brother in the baby carriage on that front of the house and hearing the reports that John Dillinger had been caught and killed. And of course at the time I didn't know who Don Dillinger was, but of course came to find out, but that was a big thing. I remember that specific date. And uh, it's possible that that's the date that my brother was in the baby carriage had been uh, injured. Let's see, whatever, beyond that, I remember when FDR had been elected, that was a chain. And of course, uh, that was my first exposure to a presidential election. And he was the president that my father had voted for. And, uh, and uh, I remember living in that particular house during the Depression, that had to be 32 when he was elected, when uh, the city had set up what they called baby health stations. There were storefront clinics where pregnant mothers could go for assistance. And they, they were also offered uh, dry milk formula. And also during the depression, you could obtain milk, fresh milk for eight cents a quart. And we lived on the fourth floor and the clinic would open say five or six in the morning. Uh, and the lines had already been formed. Now my parents would send me down uh, when the line, when the, when the clinic was about to open and, uh, and most of the adults would let me move right up front since I was such a small kid and I would pick up possibly two quarts and, uh, and I'd go back upstairs. So that's what I remember, the, the early morning darkness going down four flights of stairs uh, and getting in line with these adults and uh, receiving. Now it's possible the milk was free then. I say eight cents because that's a price I later found out milk was sold for then. But it's possible we didn't even pay the eight cents, but it's possible we paid the eight cents. Uh, so I remember that period. Uh, but. Uh, as far as historic moments, I remember being with my friend on that Sunday in December, and uh, in the afternoon, someone had said something like that, and we ran to a radio where we could hear the incoming news referring to the bombing of Pearl Harbor. So that, of course, uh, in high school, uh, by that time we were at war virtually, and uh, so certain defense programs had been initiated, the blackouts thinking we would, would be bombed by the Japanese or the Germans. And so they would black out an air raid drills. That became routine. One or more people were be assigned uh, air warden status. And it was their duty when the sirens went off to check that all lights were out and everyone was converting to dark shades if in the event they had lights or you just were forced to uh, turn out the lights if there were anything visible the wardens would just put, patrol the streets there was some i guess they called them airplane spotters as part of those teams would be on the roof of prominent high buildings and they would be looking with binoculars for foreign planes coming over but most of them were all false uh, uh, practice drills uh, during that period in high school, uh, every, part of the education program was to uh, inform the public what to do in the event of an air raid. And part of that, they expected the possibility of incendiary bombs. That was a very prominent mode. Uh, incendiary bomb was uh, a magnesium burning flare and uh, magnesium cannot be put out with hose of water. The flame is too intense. If anything, at that temperature, uh, water would vaporize or turn to steam and splatter and you'd get metal flying over you. So the hazard, the training against incendiary bomb was uh, to, to, 
to use sand. And uh, as part of the chemistry department, uh, they organized a team of fire marshals, if you will, in the event we were attacked by an incendiary bomb. And we were trained to put out incendiary bombs. I don't think an incendiary bomb ever fell on the United States. If anyone was ever burned one, it was during demonstrations. So, can so, you so we, as part of the team, we did a demonstration in the auditorium. They set fire to a pile of magnesium, and we were there with our shovels and our buckets of sand. And that, well, you know, I, I remember World War II. Then came the rationing and the stamps, and because we didn't have an automobile, so we. Would, they we weren't concerned about gasoline rationing, but there were stamps that you you could only buy maybe a bag of sugar once a week or once a month or when the when the time came there was a schedule for rotating and and fats were shortening things of that sort were restricted. There was a, a drive at the time to collect fat because that was a basis for if you render fat you get glycerin. And glycerin was was in short supply uh, for making nitroglycerin and other explosives. So, and there was metal drives collecting aluminum because we needed aluminum for the planes. And, and if you look at the documentaries, uh, there was quite an escalation in our war effort. We were a couple of years behind. We were caught flat-footed. So it took, but by the time we got rolling, I mean, they were turning out planes and ships uh, at record speeds. He wanted like 300 planes a year and we were up to 3,000 by the time you know, we got rolling, you know, that, that there was a tremendous mobilization. Some people had it quite good in the World War, during World War II, the people in business. There were exemptions for key people. And when I came out of the war and got my first job at American Seal Cap, I found out that my boss, who was director of research, was exempted because of a key industry making bottle caps. But to keep the shift going, because paper was in critical supplies and this was a big operation, and so they ended up making uh, round the clock operations where normally there would have been a 12 hour, eight or 12 hour shift. They were going 24 hours to meet the requirements of the military and what have you. And uh, I remember the history was that he, to keep the forces healthy, he had developed a spinach juice recipe. I think he got himself a wearing blender and just made gallons and gallons of, you know, it was, it must have been a health nut in his day, and it was always ready for all the employees to have, maybe through a carrot in, I don't know. But there were critical shortages. There was no liquor, no scotch, no whiskey. It all went to the, our armed forces. The only liquor that was available was rum from Cuba. And so the, the only drink, alcoholic drink that you could find outside of the illegal bootleg liquor in, in the Appalachians, White Lightning, uh, outside of that, you, you could only get uh, rum. We had a, uh, when the war ended and, and we were being disbanded in Virginia, we had a going away party for our professors and ourselves. Uh, my particular class split into two alphabetically. The first A to L went to Washington, D.C. to some code school, and the M to Z went to Fort Bragg uh, for that demobilization function that I had. But, uh, so World War II, uh, I would come home on leave occasionally, and as a bona fide GI, I could go to the USO and get theater tickets and even dinner tickets, free tickets. And, uh, and on my week leave, I just spent that whole time on Broadway. I would go in the morning, get tickets to a matinee and evening show. So I saw, I had my, saw my first play on Broadway through the USO, and I saw probably in a one week, it was not unusual to see about eight, ten shows. Uh, I remember Carmen Jones, uh, Hollywood Pinafore, it was called, a musical version of HMS 
Pinafore based around Hollywood. Got to see The Tempest with Canada Lee. Got to see, oh, some musical with Jackie Gleason, Gertrude Neeson, like two for the show, you know, one for the money, two for the, it was a series of musical reviews. I remember seeing the, uh, the male animal with Elliot Nugent, who wrote it and acted on, on, in that play at the time. Got to see quite a few plays that I remember, and I was really hooked on the theater. Yeah. And uh, in fact, when I went to Columbia night, I registered for a theater course, and, and uh, well, the instructor was a, a producer and director was, uh, who started with uh, another co-producer, and they opened the Phoenix at the time. His name was Norris Houghton, and the other guy was Hamilton, I think, and eventually they split and Hamilton ran the rest of the Phoenix Theater. But Norris Houghton had uh, gone to Moscow and studied with uh, Stanislavski, and he wrote a book called Moscow Trial, not Trial, Moscow something, based on the Moscow Theater Group and his adventures there, and uh, enjoy that course. Uh, so I spent, uh, I'd say, about a year and a half uh, at Brooklyn Poly to get my degree, and then I ran into someone who was taking a course in industrial engineering at Columbia, told me all about it, all about it, and uh, got me enthused about possibility of industrial engineering and getting a master's. So I went there for a couple of years in the evening and got my master's in industrial engineering, which, you know, had some basic principles that I, I used in my career, but I never really did much industrial engineering until I became a consultant at EI, and it was primarily on the basis of that. And then, so I had projects in industrial engineering. It all came back useful in my consulting years and then they found out that I had a degree in chemical engineering and immediately they made me a director of chemical process design so I had a, got into that aspect of it education very important to you yeah but does it sound like but but was it that important to your parents did they make a big premium oh I it? think they were proud they had no idea I mean they were ignorant of the whole society and education and the whole thing I remember as a child, I was eager to read, and my father would walk long distances from one station to get to our home, and uh, he would be passing a library. And I remember that library is still intact today. It had closed for many years, but I, I noticed recently that it's open. And I would ask him to go in there and get me a book, and I wasn't sure he could ever find any kind of book. Uh, you know, I said, he said, what kind of a book do you want? And uh, I'd say history, you know, I was interested in history as a young child. I think, as I remember, he brought me back a copy of maybe Thucydides' Roman Adventures or something, you know, <laughs> so the, the history of the Roman Wars or something. I, and, but I was an avid reader and I, uh, I eventually, I almost lived in the library once I could access it on my own and I walk and spend hours in the library and take books out and so on. So, and uh, I think they were very proud of you know my accomplishments. Uh, but as I say, my mother was asked to come to school and she had no idea why she was asked to come. And it was so she could be present when they awarded me a series of medals. And I wasn't even made aware that I was, that's what was going to happen. So, uh, <clears throat> Some of the ways that you've lived your life or set up mm -hmm. things are really in, in opposition to what it's, it's just what you describe at the house, uh, at your house. Oh. I mean, in terms of, you know, oh, wow. Papu was out drinking a yeah. certain amount. But it was uh, There was always living mm -hmm. to, uh, moment to moment. I noticed uh -huh. you've never yeah. really kept, had any credit. I mean, I mean, not that you haven't had credit. Perfect. You've never used, you've never had credit debt, that sort oh. of thing. I mean, well, do, is there any? Did, well, I don't, do you want to just address that in generally about well, the way? Well, credit, credit debt, uh, I, as I remember it, was uh, uh, my parents would buy what was absolutely necessary 
and uh, if it came in the way of furniture or anything of that sort, it was always on what they called on time. They bought things on time, which meant every week or whatever it was, they'd have to go and make a depot, uh, payment toward whatever. It was almost like chattel mortgage or anything when you stop and think about it. So, so uh, there was always a debt situation, I'm sure. I were really, in my early years, I was not aware of it, but, uh, uh, but I'm sure they were proud of all my accomplishments, you know, the, but uh, not being aware of, you know, what, what was important in terms of education. Uh, they, you know, they forced it. They, you know, I, I offered to, to, uh, to go out as a boot black, shining shoes because of the kids I were playing with in the streets. Uh, that's the way they they obtained money at that time. They would go out and shine shoes, and it seemed like the whole world at that age, everybody was out there trying to. They the the neighborhood wasn't con conducive to uh, getting a paper route. I mean, this was multi-ethnic conclave, although. The area we lived in was predominantly Italian American as a community. It was uh, there were spots of a Greek or two here and there. And there. There may have even been some Spaniards, but we were not aware of that. There was some Swedes uh, that I remember, plenty of Irish, but it was predominantly an Italian neighborhood, and uh, so it wasn't conducive to getting a paper route. We didn't have that. Kind of thing. There was there was always a corner in the newsstand, and everybody went there for the newspapers. And back then, you know, there were half a dozen, if not a dozen, newspapers. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the field trips I remember taking was to the printing plant in Brooklyn of the Daily Mirror, which is a long, extinct newspaper. It competed with the Daily News. No one really was successful with the beating the Daily News. It was always the paper had the biggest circulation. Uh, I mean, there were papers like the World Tribune, uh, the Herald Tribune, then there was the World Telegram, there was the Sun then, the Daily Mirror, Daily News. I don't think the Post was in existence then. The first news, new newspaper I remember being published was the uh, PM, it was called. Uh, it was a very radical or very liberal kind of newspaper. You know, it, uh, all the teachers in high school I was in, uh, they were predominantly very liberal, democratic, uh, maybe even communist. And, and uh, that was, you know, the paper they read, or seemed to read as I remember it. It was a, had a short life. I don't know whether it was two years or five years. Uh, I can almost remember the name of the publisher. It may have been Ralph Ingersoll. So, of course, newspapers merged through my lifetime. The, the, uh, up until 1948, the, uh, the cost of a subway ride was a nickel. And it was in 1948 that they raised it to a dime. And the joke was that it was to keep out the riffraff. They raised the price. But, uh, oh, uh, when I finished school in Brooklyn Poly before taking a full-time job, I took that opportunity to, to go to Greece. That was my first time. And uh, I found that I could take the, one of the Liberty ships at the time was going back and forth. It was called the Marine Carp. There was a shipping line that had Marine as a first part of a, a fish title, Marine Carp, Marine Shark, and things of that sort. And it had been a troop ship in its day. And in fact, the accommodations, uh, at that lower class or whatever class it was, uh, were the bunks of the troop ship. And they may have been four, four or five high stacked in this hold. Well, uh, as my mother was seeing me off, she met another woman whose uh, brother was going to Greece alone. And they got into a conversation. And since I was only 18 at the time, I think, I had to be 19. Uh, the, uh, she asked if this older man would watch over me during the whole thing, and we struck a conversation. Of course, 
going over, he was sick, seasick and ill during the whole thing, the whole trip. I virtually was on deck. I spent all my time on deck and, uh, and uh, in the bow of the ship, just like uh, our friend on the Titanic, Leo, whatever his name is. You know, just up in that bow and getting a full breeze. I remember staying awake to go through the Straits of Gibraltar as we approached that. I love that. There, the ship was held up in its departure, I remember, because uh, I guess the immigration people, maybe even the FBI, were going through and uh, stopping or questioning and stopping uh, some of the young men that were going. There were there were Jews on the way to Israel. And of course there were some Arabs. I think the going, this was a ship that went to the Mediterranean, it stopped, I think it bypassed Italy, going directly to Greece and on a return trip it would stop in Italy. But it also went to Haifa and uh, the Middle East. And so there were quite a few Jewish students or Jewish men who were going over there for the first time. And, and I think the the authorities were questioning their reasons for going. Uh, I don't know the circumstances. But, uh, and so I got to, to meet some of them. In fact, on board were some young American girls that I tried to get friendly with, whose parents were professors at the American school in Istanbul. And uh, they were on their way to visit their parents. You know, they were, I think they were college students that uh, were on summer vacation. And, you know, flying was not the way to go. It w wasn't that common. Although after my stay in Greece of a couple of months, I, I flew back rather than take the boat back. And so I had, uh, I arranged to fly by KLM from Athens on my return trip. And, uh, and it stopped at Amsterdam to change to a, a transatlantic plane. But, uh, we couldn't make a direct connection. It was, uh, the, the flights seemed to be booked. There must have been very few flights. It turned out that in England, that during that period, were the first Olympics since the war. Also, the, the World Council of Churches was meeting in Amsterdam. And during that particular week, uh, Queen Wilhelmina abdicated in favor of her daughter, Queen Juliana. So it was coronation week. And so the, uh, I was able to stay at a very fancy hotel. With I didn't know the, the eating arrangements. I didn't realize that uh, if I showed my ticket, you know, it was included in the, in the stay. And so the first night I was so ignorant. I, you know, I went to the dining room and uh, I saw the menu and the prices. You know, is <laughs> European royalty. In fact, during the coronation, quite a few heads of state. Were, you know, I was in the hotel and you could see the police warding off and the limos coming and the, I didn't, didn't know who they were, but the different heads of state were coming to stay at that hotel. It was the Hotel uh, de Europa, uh, which I subsequently saw again with Malamo when we went through Amsterdam. I wanted to look it up and find it. And uh, so I was able to spend a, an interesting couple of days in Amsterdam uh, during the coronation so I could get a flight back. And uh, uh, I remember staying up all night. It was like celebrations there were like New Year's Eve and Christmas and everything. All the natives from the outside of Amsterdam had come into town to help, you know, the celebration. I watched the parade. In fact, I have slides of pictures of the parades. Uh, I remember seeing the Dutch, just as you would see them in the early 1500s, 1600s, with wooden shoes walking through. And it was all bicycles. There were very few automobiles. There was a music park that I went to there. I remember, and I remember they're, they're eating smoked herring on the streets. They would serve them the way we serve hot dogs. They were long and narrow, herring all smoked. and. And, and a piece of newspaper, they would you'd buy half a dozen of them and people walk along the street eating smoked herring. Yeah. So this uh, 
So how old do you, what, this was 1948, you say? Yes. So you, I guess you would have been 22 then, mm -hmm. 21. Yeah, 22. right, right. So uh, what was Greece like? What was the Greece was in, well, I went to see the only relative that I was aware of that we had there, and that was uh, uh, my mother's aunt or my grand aunt. And uh, she had lived through the occupation in Greece, which was a terrible time for her. But she, she was quite a clever woman, very resourceful, and lived by her wits. And uh, her first husband had been this chef that I mentioned earlier. And, uh, and then she remarried and married a widower who had several sons, I think, and it was a contractor or house builder there. And during the war, they had difficult times, and uh, she told, of, told me of many horror stories where, you know, walking through Athens, you'd f see people just falling over and dying just from starvation. The Italians were occupying by that time, and uh, she told of following the Italian horses and gathering up the horse manure and culling out the undigested oat husks and making patties of breads and just to survive. And uh, the, the people in the city had no fuel. You know, the winters were harsh and uh, uh, virtually all the trees in Athens had been cut down for firewood. And uh, you had to walk for, I guess, hours into the, up into the mountains to find wood and cart it back for fuel. And uh, many of the, the peasants out in, had access to plants and vegetables, so they, they fared pretty well. And, uh, uh, but the city people would have to walk for hours and hours to go and find any shrubbery that they could harvest. And, and she told us a case once where he had gone out to find this particular shrub, and, and she found out that from someone that it was toxic and uh, poisonous and uh, uh, she had run out after him to find him, to, to warn him not to bring any of that. I don't know whether that was true or not. But, uh, but I got to see her after. During the war she managed to have a chicken or two. So uh, she would sell the eggs at uh, enormous prices. I mean, virtually the price of a home she would trade that. So she collected a lot of money. And when she I, was living in Athens? She was living in a suburb of Athens mm -hmm. called Moscato, which mm -hmm. is totally, at that time the streets were, the, the homes had started to be developed just before the war. And she lived in a relatively new house, but there were unpaved streets. It was close to the beach. Today the beach is polluted and you wouldn't want to swim there. But at that time I would go down and swim at the beach. Uh, it was a long walk to the subway station, that, uh, and, but I would take it regularly into Athens to go to the movies. You know. And uh, so I, I knew my way around Athens pretty well. Did a lot of walking on my own, walked through many of the suburbs just to. So uh, it was an interesting time for me. Uh, we went to a local taverna where we both got drunk on Rutina came back late. Her husband at the time was failing. I think, I don't know what he suffered when emphysema probably. He was taking, we would send him medications. When I got back, I would send him medications. Uh, I think he had a breathing problem. Uh, one of the medic medicines he was taking was coltar. I don't know what, who prescribed that for what condition, but it was a coltar uh, medication, and uh, he was a nice guy. She, he was quite a bit older than she was, and there was some conflict since uh, she inherited his house, and there were other houses along the way, and her son, her stepsons, had a condition. But I met the stepsons, and they were quite nice fellows. They wanted to know all about America, and I, they had motorcycles, and I would ride around with them on motorcycle to take me on little trips. I took a, a trip into the north because the Civil War was going on at that time and uh, you could see evidence of the fighting in Athens that had occurred. Bullet hole pock marks in many of the buildings in Constitution Square and in the other park. And, uh, but you could only go just so far. I went up to an area called uh, Kalki, 
which is uh, which had a uh, I guess uh, there was a tide there I recall through an, a narrow bridge that you crossed over where the water went into a bay and uh, it was amazing the, the rush of the water as I remember uh, as the tide changed it was just so I just went touring as much as I could. I didn't have an automobile at the time. So. And I got my first automobile, I guess, when I got a full-time job. In about 1951, I, my first car was a Mercury. It's, it was the first automobile of that year uh, that uh, had a wraparound rear window. Up until that time, the 50s, automobiles, if they had a rear window that was across was partitioned either in two pieces or in three pieces with strip but this was a unique model where they got a, a full wrap around windshield. Uh, that was a car that we had when we first married. Did you buy it new? Yes. Yeah. It cost about twenty four hundred dollars then and 1951, and that was that wasn't the cheapest car you could buy. I, mean, I I liked the Packards at the time, but I found out they were quite a bit more expensive than the Mercury's were at that time. But, uh, anyway. So and, and that's how um, I mean, it seems like oh. you stayed with the uh, Ford Motor Company. Line. Why was that? Did you have No, not really. Yet? No, no, no. It. Uh, in fact, uh, soon after we were married, I, we had enough money and I pushed for another car and we bought a Dodge. It was like a hardtop sport coupe and unfortunately it didn't last well long. I don't know, we had some engine troubles with it. And, and by that time we, we had children, one or more, and uh, the station wagon seemed to be the, so the first car was uh, the, when we moved to New Jersey, we bought the Country Squire, and we had that for several years. Right, so I guess Fords really did have the predominance in the, in the station wagon market. Yeah, at that time, I think so. Yeah. Um, and we had a Country Sedan after that, the lesser expensive model. You, you, you allude to times of, you know, thinking your mother was crazy or whatever. But no, not, not, not at, at the, the time. time but yeah. did, did, did you feel, did they, when there was problems, did you know about it in the family? Did I, they, I think you got information. Did they try to hide yeah. it? Did, they, did you feel safe? Well, my father didn't discuss it in our presence. I mean, they, they discussed it together. And then in his absence, I seem to remember my mother bringing all of the problems up to us, you know, I don't know, for a sense of guilt or complaining about what her life was like. It was, uh, you know, how things, how wonderful her youth was. I don't know how wonderful her youth was, but, you know, there would be all these mythic stories and all these stories and tales of what her life was like when she was younger and unmarried and how, how uh, was she sure. orphaned at a young age, or? Her mother died giving birth oh, giving to her. Birth, that's right. And, and the father, you know, was a seagoing person, mm -hmm. just okay. not around. And she, I don't know who, who nursed her up until the time, you know, she was starting to be brought up by her aunt. And so they were friends more than they were, uh, you know, aunt and niece kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think they were almost. I don't think it was that much of a difference between their ages. You know. But this aunt they, wasn't related to Papa Bill. This no, that was her mother's, uh, that was her, her mother, father's sister. Right, okay. okay. That was the other but side of the family. But at a certain point she was raised by Papa Bill's family. Yeah, I think so. I don't know how. They, maybe they lived in the same tenement and they used her as Cinderella or she lived with them when maybe her father was away and or had died by then. I really don't know. You know what happened to my grandfather. So, I'm sure, Dan yeah. knows all the details to that. Maybe some yeah. version of it. Yeah, right. Exactly. Some version yeah. of it. And I'm amazed that you know, her stories and my brother's stories are so identical, and they're also, you know, flaky in some of the things. Yeah. What um. 
it's as though neither of them developed beyond a certain point, you know, and whatever my mother had said, that became gospel on everything. And I think if you notice, my brother quotes his mother's stories every other sentence, every other tale that he starts with, is my mother's sentence. So I, I, the circumstances in that house, I know there were squabbles at times and anguish and uh, uh, frustrations and difficulties, but uh, I think my father worked as hard as he could. You know, you know it, was, it wasn't that he was, wasn't ambitious. I mean, work never f scared him, and I think they managed to save enough to, to buy uh, a house down on the end of 15th Street, which is, you know, it was the smallest little apartment. I don't know how they managed to get a down payment, but they did. Excuse me? Yes? Could you talk to your brother? He's available now. All righty then. Um, yeah, anyway, we were going back to the... So what about going to the movies? Talk, talk to about the movies. that. Oh, how, how would you get my to the mother, movies? My mother was the movie freak. If we didn't go every day to the movies, it was unusual when we were home. I mean, when we weren't in school, uh, she she lived for the movies. She around the corner was essentially what other people called the itch, for five cents, as I remember way back then. It was old films, you know. They weren't like the current releases. Some er, silent films early on, I remember, and they were caught two or three within walking distance. If there weren't five and. You know, compared to the walks we did as children, they were all within walking distance, but there was one right around the corner, as I remember, and uh, there was always the Greek confection. I had the stand, and he had the concession for the candy, and it was all those, what do they call them, circus peanuts, which are those orange candies. That's what I seem to remember a lot of. Uh, there were two or three films with shorts and addition. I mean, you spend the whole day there, and my mother lived in that world. She would take us, and we were there. There were serials, you know, the early... I remember there was a scene, I don't recall the name of the serial at the time, but there was a skull in a trunk pirate scene, and that used to scare the hell out of me as a kid, you know, I'd see a skull in this. But uh, and that, that stayed with me. But uh, movies, there were silent films. I remember seeing William... Will Rogers in silent films. Uh, I remember seeing a, a movie, a newsreel with uh, Thomas Edison in it, boarding a train. I mean, it goes back to those days. I remember the Willie Post, uh, Will Rogers thing where he flew to Alaska and they crashed and, and were killed. Uh, in fact, I made plane models at the time when I was growing up in would carve, you know, whittle the woods in, in shop. I think I even made a, a plane. I think it was a Wally Post plane, which was stubby at the time. Um, so the movies, my mother couldn't get enough movies, and we actually went along with it. it just, and uh, she loved the movies because she spent. There was no TV. She didn't listen to the radio, but the movies. She didn't do much reading either. So the movies were her whole life. And we were all brought up, and as my brother and sister, I mean, they, I talk about trivia that I know about movies, but they're really up on trivia when it comes to the old movies. My sister still has a, an obsession with movie stars, and there were, there were a handful that she had crushes on. Richard Widmark, recently, they honored him at some theater he was about 82 years old, and she went up to him, and he ignored it. it broke her heart. I mean, the, the one she's idolized and worshipped of all her life. And she went, took a day off from work just to go to see, you know, a little retrospect. He came alive to, to answer questions. I guess. Do you watch that, uh, that cable thing? That guy, what's his name, that has the studio... Uh, Film studio interviews. He's got a stack of cards, and he asks one after the other. Oh, you uh, mean yeah. the uh, you know, actor studio? Actor studio that one. Guy, yeah. 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 Sometimes it's interesting. Yeah. Sometimes the stories. He's the gotten. He's gotten over overbearing. Yeah. I think the first couple of years yeah, they did yeah. it, it was really yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. You really got to see yeah. inside them. Yeah. But now it seems to be more about him. Yeah. Yeah. 
A friend of mine is a teacher there. They do it mm. at the new school. New school, yeah. A friend of mine is a teacher in that mm. theater department uh -huh. there. So. so anyway. But uh, my sister had all the trivia. I don't, she must have collected photos also at the time. Uh, but uh, well, that was my mother's obsession. That was her world, the fantasy. She didn't live in the real world. And she lived in this movie world. So, um, I think, you know, so, the, so that was the movie thing. Uh, after the war, uh, when I still lived at home, a, uh, an art film studio opened up in Brooklyn and I would go religiously and every couple of days there'd be a change in, in the film presentation. There were two films at a time. It was, a, it was the Russian propaganda films of the time, the, the early Italian films. Some of them were even just film do-overs of the operas. Uh, uh, Swedish films, or all of the French films particularly at that period. I just remember one film, French film after another, Italian films. It was just, uh, and that was it. I, so I remember, I don't think there were any far any American films shown at that time. I did go to the American theater too, but uh, and I was into that film thing. That was before television. What was the name of that theater? I think it was called The Atlantic. It was uh, just on Flatbush Avenue extension and Fifth Avenue in Brooklyn, uh, near that Modell store opposite. There, I don't know what's in there now, but there was a theater there. And it was very convenient for me to go there. Yeah. What about the Fox Theater? Oh, well, the Fox Theater Fox was, Paramount. yeah, Fox and the Brooklyn Paramount the Brooklyn were Paramount. opposite one another. And the other big theater of that ilk was the Lowe's Metropolitan down on uh, Fulton Street. Those were the three big uh, movie houses in Brooklyn that featured essentially first run films. They weren't the first run of Broadway where all the premiere films would open up back in those days. But uh, maybe the next week, those same films appeared there, or maybe simultaneously. And uh, Lowy's Metropolitan generally featured the Lowy's film, the MGM photos, that was their specialty. Uh, the Fox. Later, of course, with television, uh, the movie, many of those movie houses went out of business or started to feature uh, rock and roll concerts, Fox particularly. But the Brooklyn Paranormal finally went bust and then it was taken over by Long Island University and became their campus, a whole complex of buildings and the, the uh, what was essentially the Brooklyn Paramount Theater was converted into their auditorium and, and gymnasium as part of that. What about Coney Island? I mean, I heard you mention oh, going out there before. Would you go right, out there on a fairly regular basis? Yes, or? during the summer, that was the other treat. Because for a nickel, that? you'd take the subway, all I mean, subways. Was it just you kids, or did you go with your mother? My or? mother. Okay. My father, I don't remember my father going out. Occasionally, we would go to Greek picnics with my father, and that was a big thing. We might go to Astoria, where there was a picnic. And uh, what they call Terrace View, which was a big Greek picnic grounds at the entrance of the George Washington Bridge from the New Jersey side. It was in Fort Lee. On the left side now as you approach is still since gone. Going into New Jersey on the left side for, uh, uh, there had to be uh, 50, 100 acres of property off that cliff. And it was featured, you know, it may have been Greek owned. I'm sure other people use those picnic grounds. But when there was a Greek affair, all the Greeks you knew went to that particular picnic. and. Uh, but there were picnics like that uh, everywhere. Uh, when I first met Malamo, I didn't realize that uh, the Lemnians always had their pic annual picnic in South Beach, Staten Island. South Beach was as big as Coney Island is today. I mean, it, uh, you wouldn't think it today because it, it really didn't have the kind of attractions that Coney Island. But as a beach, it was a very popular beach. and. Uh, uh, South Beach was one of the beaches. The fact that it wasn't that convenient to get to. Uh, Coney Island, everything, we lived in Brooklyn, Coney Island was a place to go. I found out later you could go a little further and that was Rockaway. Had the same thing and there was Reese Park and, and uh, people just went further and further. Valley Stream was the next town along that coast 
in Long Island, and uh, that was popular for its state park, and people would go there for their picnics. And, you know, people started to move out. The people in New York City who could afford to move to the suburbs, and the suburbs were Queens. You know, Floral Park or uh, Ozone Park, you know, and that was the tendency. And then when those areas got crowded and people got wealthier, they moved further out in the island. So. Let's get your chair over just a little bit, mm -hmm. just a tiny bit. We're, we're nearly done with this row, mm -hmm. so you're nearly mm -hmm. free. Um, yeah. Talk, uh, tell me. Tell me about the Coney Island experience. What, what was well, it like? Well, it was a picnic. Like you'd, you'd pack whatever food. You know, it was traditional with the Greeks and from all the other immigrant groups. That was a place of leisure. Uh, you'd take the subway, and depending what's, what part of the beach you wanted to go to, you, there was a walk from the station to the beach, and you carried everything. And uh, you walked to the beach, and it was a, it was a big beach, though it was crowded. Uh, I'm sure there were times when you couldn't even find a spot, but there were other times. And you'd spread the blanket, and uh, there were no coolers in those days. Uh, and uh, you weren't allowed to change bathing suits. But many of the people, you know, the women would change by someone holding a blanket around it. We, The boys would feel shy. We would go into the bathrooms that they had, and you weren't allowed to change. You know, I remember cops stopping us and saying, hey, you know you're not supposed to do that. And uh, what's your name? You know, that kind of thing. And I said, oh, Frank Mangano or something, you know. <laughs> oh, all right, we got your name now, or whatever. So, but uh, the, it was just sitting there and going into the water. I didn't know how to swim, never learned to swim. So uh, it was just going in, splashing around, playing, making sandcastles of that sort. And, and walking the boardwalk. <clears throat> and maybe buying an ice cream or something like that. And then the long walk home at the end of the day, you know, with all the crowds walking back at the same time, waiting for the next train to take you home. And everybody sunburned, <coughs> so I remember. Did you ever, uh, did, do you remember taking any Nathan. rides or the cyclone or anything like Not that? Not much. My mother would tell us how when she was pregnant with me, she took a ride on the, the Luna Park was the one that, steeplechase, which was a ride. And at one point she had uh, lost a shoe and it fell down off from one of these things. I guess she must have found it later. But uh, I should like to tell the story about that and how I think uh, she had eaten a whole watermelon one point when she was pregnant with me. So, uh, and, uh, uh, but that, you know, you try to stop at Nathan's and you have a hot dog. You could, that was, the lines would be in front of that, it was unbelievable, and yeah. Had to be half a dozen guys behind the counter just just handing hot dogs out, and french fries were a treat, you know. And the root beer, which was the thing. Of course, there was a lot of competition, but n nothing like Nathan's. I mean, even if we lived in the city and lived in Bensonhurst, it was not unusual to get in the car and drive there just for the hot dog at Nathan's, you know, it was amazing. Yeah. Still the fattest and tastiest hot dog mm -hmm. on the market. So, um, all right. So How you get going? back from uh, you get back from uh, you know from your travels. You get mm -hmm. your job. Yeah. So talk about this first job. How oh. did that feel to have a job? Well, it was good. I I enjoyed my boys. He was a very nice guy. His, he was from Lima, Ohio, with his wife had come east. He had been a chemist, and he had worked on the railroad. I mean, he, he, he was older than I were, of course, and he had grown up during the Depression. But when he took this job, uh, he, he was very creative, had innovative things that he did a lot for that company in that scientific area. In fact, uh, he went to school, to, he went to the RCA Institute, which was the thing at the time to learn electronics and electron. He had no background in that. And uh, and got all the knowledge he needed for chemistry, for the you know physical sciences, and he was quite creative. He was able to develop uh, a milk bottle cap with a special adhesive that would work th through wax. They, they at the time they impregnated paper with wax and could mold it, and 
uh, he really developed new products for them in that capacity. And it was a fluted cap, so when it came together, it was a cap preformed with flutes. And as it came together and crimped, he developed te technology and the adhesive for uh, applying an adhesive band of about a little over an eighth of an inch at the bottom of that flute so that when it closed and was heat sealed, was heated, it would seal. Now, you, to develop an adhesive that would give you a, a paper tearing bond through wax impregnated, paraffin wax, it was quite a thing. And how to manufacture these by the millions every day. And, uh, and he came up with the uh, technique for evaluating antioxidants to keep the paraffin baths from oxidizing and getting that fatty acid odor that uh, you associate with old re-waxed, re-burnt candles, you know, that butyric acid smell. And he'd come up with uh, uh, an antioxidant that stabilized the paraffin. And, and it happened to be a, a form of uh, pitch, tar, from the coal industry of petroleum that uh, at the time had not been uh, totally purified. So it had phenols in it, and it was the phenols that were the antioxidant. He was not aware of that at the time, but it, it was a particular kind of tar that the, it was produced as a byproduct in the SO refinery at the time. So they were advised that they were terminating the manufacture of that product. So he purchased up uh, all the stock that was available, maybe several hundred drums of this, and it was used at a certain small percentage uh, in the paraffin to stabilize it so that the wax would not, because the, the wax baths were like giant tubs where conveyor belts just carried the paper blanks through and, and were, and were uh, impregnated. And uh, if you take paper and try to impregnate it with paraffin, uh, there are air interstices in, in the woven fiber. So it doesn't matter what technique you use, you can't totally saturate that with wax. But he developed the most obvious thing. He, he, uh, impregnated the paper with water. He immersed them in water. The water penetrated and just got rid of all the air in the paper. Now you took this wet paper with had no air in it and ran it through the hot wax. The wax at that temperature boiled off this, the water and you know there was no water left. It, actually they controlled the amount of water but there was no air left and the water, most of the water went out and was replaced by the wax. So you got virtually 100% saturation of, of the paper and that was his development. Now at those temperatures the wax would oxidize. You know it's the same wax being used over and over as the paper would go. It was a 24 hour operation. And, uh, but he found that the addition of, of this particular tar kept the uh, wax from going sour or oxidizing. So, but their stock began to diminish as they consumed the, the few hundred drums. And, and when I joined the company, I got the assignment to find a substitute for that. So he had developed uh, an interesting, simple device for evaluating the efficiency of uh, oxygen. And, it, and you started with uh, uh, the hot wax being pumped back and forth from one volumetric flask to the other with oxygen, stoppered up a closed system, and uh, as the wax was oxidized, it absorbed the oxygen. So all you had to do was after so many hours of running, you measured the amount of ox oxygen that was still left in these cylinders. And it was a you know, very simple technique, and he had developed that thing. So the first job I ha had was to start getting samples of virtually every material I could find in that kind of a nature and, and looking for an effective uh, antioxidant. Well, they were using maybe a half a percent of this tar in a formula. Well, I ended up finding some new synthetic antioxidants that used maybe uh, one hundredth of that even less, 
just as effective, if not more so. And it was food grade material at the time. And uh, I mean, we evaluated non-food grade materials too. But, uh, but I got a good grounding in antioxidants as a result. And as a result of this, uh, we both applied for a patent. But it, you know, it was, it had been patented. Essentially the thing was patented. Turned out to be this BHA or BTA that you find in all your French fried products that keep them from turning rancid. But that was the first time that was being used for, uh, you know, for this application. But I learned a lot working with him. He was quite a gentle, uh, interesting. What was his name? Uh, Herbert Vore, V-O-R-E. His wife was quite a talented singer. In fact, she was part of the chorus in Annie Get Your Gun when Ethel Merman was in it in the original. So his job was to take, or she would go in, into the city. They were living in, I think, Forest Hills at the time, and she would go for the matinees and the evening performances. And he was quite proud of her. She was a beautiful woman. And in addition to that, she, we, I once attended a, a recital she did at some, somewhere, I don't remember where. I was advised of it, so I showed her. She, you know, she could sing everything, but she ended up in the chorus of any, you know, coming from Ohio, the small town girl makes good in the city. But I don't think she did much of that. I mean, she had some recitals here and there. And uh, eventually, I think for whatever reason, he was offered a, a better job in Nashua, New Hampshire with a company and moved out there. And last I heard, I think she died, but I may be wrong. But I met some interesting people. It was five years I spent with American Seal Cap. At that time, I had married, and many of my friends, associates at Seal Cap came to our wedding. And uh, but after that, I I saw I wasn't going anywhere. He was about to leave, and they they had hired someone else to take his place. In other words, I wasn't about to move up. This was an all wasp company, all founded in New England, and. Uh, so the fellow they hired was a, uh, a nice guy, a family man uh, from Maine. His father had been the janitor at the college. That was his, but he, he'd gotten a college education in paper chemistry. And so they found him more qualified. His name was Russell Wilson, very nice. I was invited. He bought a home in uh, Levittown, Long Island. And I stayed over the night at his house in invitation. You know, it was a long haul in those days even to work in Long Island City and drive out to Levittown. In this day and age, it probably takes three times as long, you know, even at the no high speeds. Let's, uh, right. let's, let's uh, stop that now okay. and we'll pick this up another time. Okay, Bill. It wasn't so painful, huh? No, I'm going to move. Lots to do. And